Musali, and um, my professor is not here today, but you all met him yesterday evening, uh, Professor Ramazar. So I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. I'm from the Division of Human Genetics here at UCT, and before that I studied Forensic Science in the UK, and my undergrad was also completed at UCT. And so my passion for ancient DNA sort of grew out of my experience with working with uh, dead bodies in the morgue during my undergrad, and then going on to doing forensic science. And then from that, all these questions that I had about um, modern humans, who we are, how we've come to be, and what makes us up genetically. So I now invite you to listen to my talk on ancient DNA and the relationships from human origins to modern populations. So I am working as part of the team of a, multidiscipl well, a multidisciplinary team, and this is from the Department of Archaeology across the Department of Anthropology as well as human genetics. So we all work together to try and answer and solve questions about ancient populations. So just by way of introduction, so when we talk about ancient DNA, we have to go back and look at the past. So the story of human origins and diversity is a story of Africa. And as Africans, we are very interested in telling this story. So what we do know is that modern humans originated in Africa about 200,000 years ago. And then following that, they spread to the rest of the world, and that was about 50,000 to 150,000 years ago. So essentially what we see in the rest of the world today, the variation we see is closely related to the variation we see in Africa. So essentially, all life started in Africa. So just to take you back even further and looking at the fossil record of, you, of our human origins. So here we can see that most of the evidence for human evolution has been found in, sorry, I don't have a pointer in East Africa and Southern Africa, and particularly Kenya, which has a rich fossil history. So then looking at the hominid family tree, and I have to touch on a bit of evolution, while that is not the focus of my talk, it's just providing a bit of background to what I'll be discussing. So over the last seven million years, we can see the progression from early hominids up to what we, are today modern humans. So about seven million years ago was the emergence of these early hominids, and they then evolved into Australopithecine, the robust Australopithecine, and then further on to humans. But so what about Africa, and how do we fit into this whole <laughs> genetic story? So Africa has long been called the cradle of humanity from which our ancestors spread across the world about 50,000 years ago. So now we do know that there have been several discoveries within Africa which are important to understanding human origins. And most famously, we know of Homo naledi. And Homo naledi was first discovered in 2003 at a cave in Johannesburg at the Rising Star. And what we know about Homo naledi is that they found 15 partial skeletons within the cave, and they also talk about stature and height and several other um, attributing factors. But they did try and get some DNA from uh, Homo naledi, but it was not successful. But I'll talk more to that further on. So then, recently, scientists discovered that the world's oldest human, or the world's oldest Homo sapien, was discovered in Morocco. Sorry, I don't have a pointer, but here we are. In Morocco, and was dated to about 300,000 years ago. So you can see the dispersal of the discoveries of these remains, and they are largely from Africa. So what do skeletons tell us? Well, anthropologists and archaeologists, they study these remains, and then they're able to tell us about the stature of an individual, they're able to tell us about the brain size, and they're able to tell us about diets and how these individuals have evolved over time. So what they do is they essentially write a story. They tell us about how they lived, um, if they were using tools, 
were they using fires, what sort of food they were eating. And all this is done by looking at the morphology of a skeleton. So they're looking at the outward appearance of how a skeleton looks. But there have been so many questions, and something was always missing. And one thing that was missing was we don't have the, the molecular genetics. We don't know how these individuals look genetically. So we can see, or we're told about how the skeletal size, the, the brain size, we, we know how stature has evolved from bigger to smaller, but could genetics tell us more? And the short answer is yes. Yes, we can learn more from genetics, but this was about 20 years ago, and the problem is, in order to get ancient DNA from an ancient skull, you have to destroy the sample. And as a scientist, you're not going to feel good about destroying a valuable resource like a, an ancient skeletal remain. So everyone was like, that's not an option at this stage. Let's look at it at a later stage. Because what we're really interested in is preserving the skeletal record, because that is the history of human origins. And so only really in the last 20 years was there a boom, or well, when ancient DNA started, there was a boom in the discovery and the technology and the advancement of sequencing that now enabled us to be able to sequence these genomes. And we can really do this from a very tiny fragment of DNA. So then the question is, what is ancient DNA? Well, essentially, ancient DNA is the retrieval of a DNA sequence from really anything that is no longer living. So we can get it from mummies. We can, get it, we can retrieve DNA from skeletons. We can retrieve DNA from pathogens that no longer exist. We can retrieve DNA, or, um, yeah, retrieve DNA from extinct species like the woolly mammoth that also no longer exists. And we're also able to get DNA from tooth samples. So ancient DNA is a new instrument, or a new scientific instrument, which all begins with, in our case, a bone sample. So here we have a bone sample, and we've selected the region of interest. We then take it to a clean laboratory, and here we're quite paranoid about limiting exposure to contamination. So we're all required to wear the required um, uh, protective clothing, which is gloves and these funny suits that you see us wearing. Um, we wear gloves, we wear suits, we wear uh, face masks and hair masks and uh, boot covers to make sure that we're not contaminating any evidence that is present. Because in the past, when someone had discovered ancient DNA, the authenticity was always questioned because someone would say, well, surely it's just your DNA that you've um, contaminated the item with. So in order to limit this contamination, we dress up like this. And then we generate a bone powder from our sample, and then we get the DNA from the bone powder and we sequence this. And I'll just talk more to that further on. So what makes ancient DNA interesting? Well, it is genetic time travel, where we're able to look at extinct species. And this was first attempted in 1984, where Higuchi et al tried to isolate some DNA from the extinct Quaha zebra. And this was from a museum sample. And this zebra was extinct. So the fact that Higuchi tried to isolate this, um, it was sort of a shot in the dark, because this was the first attempt at trying to do something like this. And after many failed attempts and many experiments, he wasn't able to get the genome, and he wasn't able to um, sort of recover the extinct species, but he was able to isolate little fragments of the, um, the genome. And then come about 15 years later, we get the Neanderthal genome. And in 2010, Green et al. published the first draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome. And this took them about five years, and it costed them 100 million euros. So if you just think about that, how, how a genome can cost 100 million euros, and that's euros. Um, it's taking quite some time, and you're spending so much money, and it was a draft sequence. Still a big feat in science, but still something we needed to work on. So then what else is interesting about ancient DNA? 
Well, we can look at the mixture between humans, and we can look at the mixture between humans and ancient hominids, and that's what Green et al. looked at. They looked at the mixture between the Neanderthals and um, modern humans, and what they uncovered was that all modern humans existing today outside of Africa have a 2% Neanderthal component within their genome, which was quite interesting. Um, So then going back and looking at the history of ancient DNA, because so much has happened and so much has changed, and with advancements, we're able to do so much more today. So as I've mentioned, in 1984, that's when the research began for ancient DNA. And then in 1994, they were able to um, find the DNA of tuberculosis on a 1,000-year-old or within a 1,000-year-old mummy. And so with the mummy, why that happens is because a mummy is completely dried out, the skin is completely desiccated, and this somewhat preserves everything contained inside the skeleton, and also the pathogen as well. And in 1997, there was the first successful identification of the malarial DNA from human remains, as well as later on, the um, ancient virus had answers to the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. And then in 2010 is when we really see the boom of genomes being released or being published. And I've mentioned Neanderthal genome. And the secrets of the pharaohs were also um, unveiled or revealed. And the family tree of Tutankhamun was revealed. And in 2010, they also looked at the Greenland settler Inuk. And his whole genome was decoded. And in 2011, from the small little finger bone, um, they were able to find the missing human species in Siberia, the Denisovans. In 2013, we were able to get DNA from the fossil, fossilized dental <coughs> plaque traces in, in the human diet. And then in 2016, it was when we had the first publication of an African ancient genome. And then in 2017, we had the publication of several African genomes. And this was quite interesting because if life started in Africa, why have we only, why have we taken so long to get an African genome? Um, and then following that, ancient DNA research has grown rapidly and more sequences are being published as more discoveries are being made. So then where do we get our ancient DNA sources from? So typically, we get our ancient DNA sources from archaeological sites. So we uncover a human skeletal remain. We get bones. We get teeth. We get dental plaque. We can even look at hair. We often also look at samples from museums for extinct species. Um, sometimes we look at plants and animals as well. But it's important here for me to highlight that the South African climate is not very conducive to the preservation of DNA because we have a very hot, dry climate. So with some of the samples we had, we didn't think that we'd be able to get ancient DNA for, because our samples have been handled so many times. They're stored in a bone room. It's very dry. Um, there was just, we had very little um, hope that, that it would actually work. However, when looking at samples from the colder climates, like in Europe, um, these remains are often found in caves or in the permafrost, and that essentially um, protects the DNA or preserves the DNA because it's so cold. So then how do we do this extraction of DNA? So up on the top here, and I can introduce everyone, um, I think you've met Raj yesterday and then John Parkington from Archaeology. And here we are selecting the appropriate samples. So for my project, I looked at this particular group of remains from the Western Cape. And what we did was we wanted to get more information on the genetics of these samples. So here we were selecting the samples. And then the samples went off to Germany uh, to the paleogenetics lab. And I spent some time at the lab to learn the techniques and do all the ancient DNA extractions myself. So what we do is we select the bone sample and we then extract the bone powder. And how we get the DNA is we, we release the DNA in a watery mixture 
where we also remove contaminants and proteins from the mix. And then we convert the DNA fragments, which are short and degraded, to a form that we can sequence. So with ancient DNA, we expect these short degraded fragments. Uh, so here you can see them. So they're short and degraded because they're old, essentially. So when we look at our mixture of genetic material, it's actually a soup of DNA. And we're only interested in the human DNA, but we have plant DNA, we have bacterial DNA, and we have fungal DNA. So what we need to do is we need to fish out the 5% of the DNA that we're interested in. So what we do is we enrich for that area of interest. And then with ancient DNA, there are challenges because firstly, people question the authenticity. So you need to be able to prove the authenticity of your ancient sample. And how you do this is you look at the DNA degradation. So in bones and teeth, very little DNA survives. And we know this because DNA degrades over time. And what we expect are these short degraded fragments. And this is merely a representation of how your DNA degrades over time. And then looking, we can look at a damaged profile of your DNA. And essentially what that is, is when you look at your fragments, it's short little fragments and the ends they are susceptible to damage because there's no protection. So we end up with this characteristic smiley pattern. The smiley pattern, and that is indicative of ancient DNA. So now we've converted the DNA to a form you can sequence, and how, how you sequence it is very important. Because we didn't think the samples would do that well, we used a shotgun approach. And what the shotgun approach is, we just take random chunks of the DNA, and we're trying to look at how much of the endogenous DNA is present, so how much of the actual DNA is there. So because the process is quite um, lengthy and quite expensive, we really wanted to know that there was a sample there before we went um, in and did the entire genome. So we took the shotgun approach, and then we also did the capture method. So what the capture method is, is we're pulling out the regions of interest. So we're taking a targeted approach, and we're only pulling out what we want. So this capture approach is where we take the, we take the DNA that we've ex extracted, and we then, sorry, um, sorry, I have to drop. And Paul, sorry, do you have a, uh, do you have a pointer, please? Oh, okay, thanks. Sure, sorry. Um, so we take the DNA that's extracted and we then have these fragmented fragments, short reads, and we create a library. And then, in, to put it simply, we then make copies of these libraries in order to fish up our DNA of interest. So we create a bait, which is the area of our, our target sequence, so we know what it is. We attach the bait to our beads and we wash it over our samples and if the sample is complementary to what's on the bait, it'll stick. And then it'll wash away, we wash away whatever we're not interested in. And that is, that is how we capture what we're interested in. So then to bring it closer to home and to the work that I've been working on <laughs> is my work is focused in the Western Cape. So everything else I've mentioned before is sort of a background and an introduction to my work and that's this is more the focus of what I, of what I, what I work on. So we had, a, we had a group of skeletons from a site in Clan William in the Western Cape. The archaeology department excavated these remains in the 80s, and these remains have been previously studied. So here we have, so where the arrow is, this is where the cave is, and it's on about 100 meters up. That's a, quite a, a steep hill that you have to climb. Sorry, I apologize. I don't have a pointer. Okay. Um, don't see the arrow. Okay. This is the inside of the cave, and we see there's a rocky outcrop, which is sort of a protection within the cave. And when you stand out on the cave, so I actually did this hike up towards the cave, uh, 
and I did it with my professor, and it was very steep, and when he got to the top, he had heart palpitations, and he needed to take one of those sublingual beta blockers, because it was quite rough. So, um, and we were just all thinking, how would we get access to emergency, because we're in the middle of nowhere. So, when you're standing in, in the cave, and you're looking out, you're facing the coastline, and it's quite a good vantage point because you can actually see who's coming and who's approaching the cave. So for these 12 individuals who were living there, that was quite a good, a, quite a good spot to live in because you could see whoever was coming and you'd always be ready. And so then inside the cave, this is, this is how it looks. It's about eight meters by five meters wide. And they were said to have lived in this cave as well as buried in this cave. So just before I go there, how the remains were uncovered. So this cave is on the property of a farmer. And the farmer went and he removed some of the remains. And then this is much later, he let the archaeology department know. And then we came, well, the archaeology department came in and they excavated the remains in a systematic fashion. And then what they had done previously was they were able to uncover archaeological data, osteological data, as well as radiocarbon data. So what we were interested in with these 12 individuals, or what they were interested in, was trying to define the group in terms of male and female and getting age ranges for, for everyone present. So of the 12 individuals, we were able to determine the sex of the individuals. And this is done by looking at the skull and the pelvis. So when you're looking at a male skull and you're looking at a female skull, you, you're looking at certain characteristics. So a male skull is much bigger, um, has more prominent features, especially on the brow ridge, whereas a female skull is a lot more gracile, it's a lot more light, it's a lot smaller. And then if you look at the pelvis, a female pelvis is wider and a male pelvis is narrow. So in some instances, we were unable to identify the sex of the individual because these bones were just not present. But in the two individuals on the top, we were unable to identify the sex because these were juveniles. So they were put in an age range between two and seven. And how we, how we um, determine the age range is we look at the eruption of teeth and we look at the fusion of the long bones. So as you grow, your bones grow. And then when you've grown to your full size, your bones fuse because this is when you've reached your maximum height or your maximum size. So looking at this fusion, we were able to put these individuals in age ranges. And about four of the individuals were placed between 25 to 35 years, and then the rest were placed between 35 and 45 years. So what we were looking at here was essentially a group. And it looked like this group was a family, because there were males, there were females, there were children. They ranged from very young to very old. What we were also interested in was we needed to date these skeletons. So we sent a few of them for dating, and they've dated these skeletons to a time between 2,100 and 2,000 years ago. So with this unique group of remains, which were found on the top of a cave, in, sorry, in a, in a cave on the top of a hill, many questions came about. So, Walking up that hill, how did the remains get there? How did, were they killed in the cave? Did something happen and everyone was killed at the same time? Um, how were they related? Were these individuals family? How did they die? Could we say anything about how they died? And could we obtain the genetic information from the remains to reconstruct the past? So then this is where my work comes in. And my work, or my research, was then to reconstruct the ancient African genomes. So in order for me to do this, I needed to extract the ancient DNA from the remains. And like I said before, we, were, we weren't sure if we were going to get DNA from these old remains. And then when I went to Germany, I learned the technique. I practiced on a cave bear sample. It worked. I did it on my samples, and it worked. But not all the samples yielded DNA, but that was expected. And then following that, I also wanted to look at or identify the relationships between the individuals recovered at the site. 
So following the ancient DNA, or the extraction of ancient DNA, and then following the sequencing of this DNA, we were then able to determine the sex using genetics, and then comparing the sex with, that, was, that was determined from genetics, comparing that with morphology. And then we were also able to draw a tree. And this tree was able to tell us about the relationships between these individuals. And then we also wanted to compare the ancient populations with modern populations. So for the sex determination, we wanted to determine whether these ancient individuals were male or whether they were female. So before, the sex was done using morphology. And of course, you need to rely on the availability of a pelvis and a skull. But with ancient remains, you're not really sure what you get. You're either getting fragmentary remains, you're getting um, uh, morphologically altered remains, or you may even end up with no pelvis or no skull. So this is where sequencing data comes in, and it's able to tell you about the genetics without actually looking at the skull. So here in the middle column, we have the sex that was determined by morphology. And then we have the sex that was determined by genetics. Oh, I think the pointer is coming. That one, thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So here we have the morphology as determined by the anthropologist. Sorry, the sex determined by, um, by morphology by the anthropologist. And the sex determined by genetics. So yes, we do have some instances where we confirm the sex determined by uh, morphology. However, in other instances, there's a discrepancy in what we see. And so again, this may be because when you're looking at a skull, sometimes it's not as clear that it is a male skull. Sometimes it looks like it's male, but it may actually be female. But because you don't have the rest of the skeleton to put it in context, you're not quite sure. And so this is how ancient DNA is able to help us conclusively determine the sex of individuals. So then we're also interested in reconstructing the past. So in order to reconstruct the history of an individual, we look at the genome and we look at the differences observed. So what we expect or what we want to see is that we'll group individuals based on variation. So these variation patterns are spread geographically across southern Africa. So you can almost see how they lie on the map. So certain groups share a specific genetic variation present in all individuals from a geographic region. And these are called mitochondrial haplogroups. And a mitochondrial haplogroup is a, on the, is a maternal inheritance, is a haplogroup. <laughs> it's a maternal, sorry. <laughs> a maternally inherited haplogroup. And the haplogroup L0 is found in Africa, and it's where all maternal haplogroups started. And these then subdivided further into clades distributed across Africa. But for the purpose of my study, I was merely interested in haplogroup L0D. And here, just to show you the distribution of the mitochondrial haplogroups. So this is L0, and this is how L0, L0 moves out to become L02 and L03 to the rest of the world. But down here in sub-Saharan Africa, we expect to find L0D. So these L0D is a representation of the variation in the pattern that we see in the genetics. And the mitochondrial DNA and, my, and the mitochondrial haplogroups is a widely used tool to study human evolution. So this is just sort of a simplistic view to show you how inheritance patterns or how um, phylogenetics will draw the tree between individuals. So individual A and individual B have a common ancestor at this point. And then individual B and A have an ancestor in common with C at this point. So just to give it a little bit more context, we did this with my samples. And so we looked at these variation patterns, or these patterns of variation. And what it did was it clustered together in terms of the common differences it had. So these four individuals clustered under the subclade L0D2. And these three individuals clustered with L0D1. So it tells us that they're both from southern Africa, 
but they're also very different from each other because they don't have the same variation pattern, but yet they are almost so closely related, but also they're found within the same group and at the same site. And then we had something very peculiar where we had L0F. So just to go back here, L0F is typically from east, from the east. So how it ended up in southern Africa also raised many questions because we were kind of wondering, well, how did this individual get here? So we went back and looked at the DNA, and this individual was a male, so possibly he may have married into the group. Or his mother is obviously from East Africa. But this just is so interesting because how did L0F end up in a region or uh, in a distributed amongst L0D, which is typically the sub-Saharan African populations? So then we wanted to expand the study, and we wanted to look at whole genome sequencing. So just to give you an idea of the number of sequences we're looking at, or the size of the sequences we're looking at. So the, the whole genome is 3 billion base pairs long, whereas the mitochondrial genome is 16,000 base pairs long. And with the nuclear genome, we expect a variation in the numbers of 3 million. So we're working with vast amounts of information, and we're still working through this information, and the study is fairly new, and it's still ongoing. So it's just there's so much data, and working through the data is quite um, a huge task. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to relate our individuals, which were our ancient African individuals, and we wanted to include some from the rest of Africa, and we then wanted to put this together with present-day sub-Saharan African populations. And we wanted to know how are these individuals related and how do they fit together. And just for a bit of context, the remains are 2000, or between 2,000 and 9,000 years old. So here's a map of Africa. And what we've done is we've, <coughs> yeah, these are the sampling locations of where we've taken ancient DNA from. And then the spots or the circles in gray these are the present-day populations. So we know that African populations harbor the greatest genomic diversity. And here, we plotted these same samples looking at specific African populations. So up here, again, in the gray circles, we have present-day Eastern African ancestry, we have present-day Western African ancestry and Southern African ancestry. So we wanted to know how do these ancient populations fit with the present populations. So so for the most part, we, we can say that the ancient DNA was most similar to that of the people living in the same place where the bones were found. And the interpretation of this is then that the populations that are existing today is correlated to the ancestral populations that previously existed. So that was something that was quite interesting because we wanted to know, do we look the same today as we did back in, well, the samples are about 9,000 years, from 9,000 years ago. And essentially the answer is yes. Yes, there have been a few changes, and you can sort of see how they separate out from one another. So this just tells us about their genomic diversity, that they're quite diverse from one another, whereas they appear to look the same, but genomically they're very different because the African genetics just is, the diversity is what makes them so interesting. And so it's clear that ancient DNA studies um, with larger samples need to be looked at that cover sort of uh, larger chronological and geographical areas, and that'll tell us more about these ancient populations and how, um, and how they fit with modern populations today. And then in conclusion, and what I hope that I've gotten through to you today was that there's a wide range of genomic works going on and the information we generate from these ancient samples is quite vast. And sequencing technologies have evolved or not evolved, have advanced over the years. And we're able to sequence something in two days that took us five years before. 
And the costs have also reduced quite considerably, so it's a lot more um, cost effective to do these sort of projects. So it's now more feasible for us to do ancient DNA projects and to undertake this type of work in Southern Africa. And then also just to note that the genomic data coming out of these studies vastly supplements the work that was done by archaeologists and anthropologists. And then I'd just like to thank the collaborators and everyone who's helped me. And if you have any questions. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Sure, do you have a question? How do you know for sure that all of your new lines originated in Africa? Is that DNA testing being done in the entire Europe population? So, no, it, it hasn't been done for the entire population. Um, that is a very um, interesting question because it always, it's, People always sort of touch on that because it's got to do with evolution and it's always very exciting. But I think that not everyone has been sequenced, as we know, but they've looked at samples from um, ancient sites and so they've sort of chronologically put this on a, a time scale and that's how they came up with a, to simplistically put it that way, with that time period. I mean, that's a very interesting question, and I couldn't possibly begin to understand because I myself sometimes question, well, how did life start? And I mean, that's just something to think about. So I'm, I'm trying to look back at the past and bring it into the future, but that's a little bit further back than I've looked. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, in the purple, yeah. Oh, right, so we did eventually come to a, an hypothesis, and what we, um, what we looked at was the skeletal markings. We looked at the pathology of the remains, and they seem to have been, um, they seem to have been in a fight because there were uh, sort of markings at the back of the Achilles heel, or well, the Achilles tendon on the ankles. So it looked like there was a fight, and that's how they all ended up in the same burial space and how they all ended up dying in the same event. So Basically, yeah. <laughs> What's new? Sure. Interesting. Um, so, in my understanding, the, the variation that you see outside of Africa in the rest of the world is closely related to the variation you see inside of Africa. 
and that is something that we've expected. And what happens is when these um, people moved out, or when there was a migration to the rest of the world, we see um, adaptations that happen. And so this changes the DNA as well as mutations occur, and that's related to environment and other um, factors. So what happened is with my samples we looked at and we saw selections for adaptations for taste and for UV. So what that tells me is that um, they adapted the protection to UV because they're exposed to the sun. And then when you're further north or in Europe, you may not need that adaptation. So what happens is it deletes from your genome because it's, it's, it's not necessary. So I would say that the environment is also quite, um, it also influences the adaptations that occur within the genome. So it may just mean that things we no longer need falls away and then within Africa, there's so much diversity, again, because you said this is where the origins of life are, um, and this was the melting pot of it all. And then when it left, it almost sort of became more dilute, if that, if that begins to answer. Yeah, like dilute your... Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm wondering whether you look at influence of at the ice ages. I'm thinking particularly in biologic, photochemical uh, terms at the moment, because we are right in the middle of one of the of the most steeply diverse hotspots when it comes to botany. The Cape I won't be able to answer because I haven't studied the Ice Age, and um, I just wouldn't be able to answer that question. Yeah, but it is quite interesting. It is an interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yes. So the idea was that when the populations left Africa, they went east and they met the Neanderthals. Okay. And then there was interaction between modern humans and these Neanderthals. And then they went on to spread out to the rest of the world. And so that is how that 2% um, component of Neanderthal is present in everyone else outside of Africa. Okay. Because the understanding is that the Neanderthals weren't in Africa. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Which is actually fairly young. Um, I'm just curious. Um, how old, what's, the, what's the oldest uh, uh, um, fossils that have been sequenced? Do you know the yeah. actual printings? Did you know about uh, mitochondrial teeth and Adam? Mm -hmm. Well, not in Southern Africa, because it's fairly new, and this is why 9,000 years... Yeah, so worldwide, they've found older um, remains. So I know that the team in Copenhagen, they sequenced a, I think it was a horse, and they sequenced the horse from 700,000 years ago. And the German team that I worked with, they sequenced the oldest human ancient genome from uh, 30,000 years ago, years old, years <laughs> years old, which was the early human from Spain. So that was found in a cave in Spain. So they're certainly finding older specimens of, of humans. And I think it's more just a matter of a catch-up that needs to happen in Africa, where we, we actually need to sort of allow um, the scientists to look at the older remains, because we certainly have older specimens. Um, but we're not really 
sure whether or not we would risk the valuable skeletal remains to get a DNA sample, because they're quite fragmentary. Was that Yeah, yeah, that was sequenced, yeah. That genome was sequenced, yeah. No, 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 this, the Spain one is 30,000. Yeah. Okay, well, if those are all the questions, um, I'd like to thank everyone for being here and attending, and I hope you've learned something new. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yes, 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 yeah. Sorry, I wasn't implicit, yeah, yeah. So what I, what I mean is uh, the Khoisan and how us today 